Well, good morning, uh, Albuquerque Church. I got to be honest, I was looking forward to seeing Roadrunner. Do they really exist? You know, maybe I was thinking with the Acme, the Bugs Bunny thing. I was excited to see one of those things. But I really want to say, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the Petersons. Uh, just an amazing couple that we consider friends in the gospel. Thank you to the Days as well. I uh, had a blast with them and their children. And thank you to the church and those that drove us around and got, brought me to vegan places. I, I was a nuisance, I know. But thank you for taking me to vegan spots. I thank you guys. Guys, honestly, you guys, the church here, are such a loving family. And it's funny because I did this sermon uh, several weeks ago. And I was wondering, what should I preach about? And so today I'm talking about a family that matters. And Albuquerque Church, you guys matter. You know, a family matters is a family that's set apart to change the world. And I really believe that you guys are set apart to change the world. You know, the family unit is one and should be the most cherished place in which we honor, protect, and nourish one another. I believe that it's the most important, however attacked unit, is the family unit and structure. It's been getting attacked for centuries, and the world and spiritual forces haven't and won't stop. Yet we are the family of God. If we've chosen to follow him, which means we are supposed to live a life set apart. You know, the definition of family, according to the dictionary, a family is a group of two or more persons related by birth, marriage, or adoption who live together. All such related persons are considered as members of one family. The Hebrew word for family, both in the Bible and in modern Hebrew, is mishpacha. Mishpacha. But just like in English, mishpacha means much more than your immediate relatives by blood or marriage. It can refer to close friends and even those bound by the same faith or lineage. What is family? Family is a collection of individuals who have and express a shared purpose. The purpose is to cooperate, to help themselves and the other family members grow, succeed, and feel good about themselves. But the choice is to respectfully assist and communicate with each other is the key element of family. You know, behind you I have, this is not my family, <laughs> but behind you I have the shows of family, back when I grew up, I'm maybe dating myself, they had a lot of shows on family. Yeah. They had a lot of shows on the cartoons on family. Yeah. This is one of the families I grew up watching. All right. Does anybody know who that is? Yeah. Who knows who that is? Yeah. Family Ties. Yeah. Michael Keaton, baby. Yeah. Stephen and El Elise Keaton, once in the 1960s, radicals now found themselves in the R Ronald Reagan era of America trying to raise a traditional suburban family. Their three kids are Alex, a very ambitious young man, Mallory, a crazy and boy crazy fashionista, and Jennifer, who we first get to know as a precocious nine-year-old tomboy. And then we have, who's that? The Waltons. The Waltons. The life of depression ever family in the Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains is the subject of this wholesome series. The show is seen from the point of the view of the eldest son, John Boy, who eventually goes to college and serves in World War II and becomes a novelist. Who's this? <laughs> Yabba Dabba Doo, baby. This is the Flintstones. I love the Flintstones. 
You got to have a special uh, cable thing to watch the Flintstones. <laughs> this was the modern Stone Age family residing in bedrock. Fred Flintstone worked in an unsatisfying quarry job. <laughs> but returned home to lovely wife, Wilma. And eventually he died at Pebbles. Fred, a big fan of golf and bowling, also enjoyed bullying his neighbor, Barney Rubble. <laughs> While Barney's saucy wife, uh, Betty, was best friends with Wilma, during the show's run, Barney and Betty would adopt an unnaturally strong son named Bam Bam, yeah. who become best friends with Little Pebbles. <laughs> the Flintstones were inspired by the Honeymooners. The next one, who knows who that is? The Brady Bunch, here's a story of men named Brady. <laughs> An architect widower with three sons, oldest oh, Greg, middle Jan, and little one Cindy. Tending to them is a wacky maid named Alice. Yeah. They all live in a four bedroom, two bathroom house um, in Los Angeles suburbs. And then you know that she married his, they married his wife and they made a family called the Brady Bunch. Last but not least, I'm not going to go, in, I'm still hurt by this situation, but anyway. <laughs> the Cosby Show of the Huxtables. Yeah. It centers on the lives of the Huxtables, an obstetrician named Cliff, his lawyer wife named Claire, their daughters Sandra, Denise, Vanessa, and Rudy, and son Theo. Based on Bill Cosby's life, the show focused on observations of family life. Although based on comedy, the series also addressed some more serious topics such as learning disabilities and teen pregnancy and many more things. You know, these shows were made to reinforce family, and you watched them and you took a different challenges they faced as family. It was also, I believe, during those times, they meant to bring a lightheartedness. But, you know, this is a great way that we've tried to show family. But God has another way that he sees family. He sees us as being a set apart light. So family, what is the purpose of family? Families serve many different purposes or functions in our lives. Families provide the following. Purposes, functions for the younger generations. How to socialize. How to meet physical needs. How to meet emotional needs and influence roles in society. You know, but I really believe that God desires a deeper meaning. You know, biblical families offer us a rich portrait of what one can look like. But what God intended to communicate to us is the idea of family. The first thing to remember as we discover the depth of Hebrew meaning of mispacha is that God is its founder and biggest advocate. He established the first relationship with man and encouraged man to have a relationship with someone else. He wanted two people to start a family. You know, family is really about a foundation and the values and a belief system. You know, I, I remember, my, I'm a Gibson. It's actually G-I-B-S-O-N. And I'm a Gibson, and my dad taught me that my name meant something. And back then, when they had uh, Samsonite luggage, my dad took, uh, got a, a monogram painting thing and sprayed the initials on all of our luggage for WMG. All the boys were named initials WMG. I'm Wesley Martin Gibson. My brother was uh, Wayne Michael Gibson. And my dad, who is now deceased, was William Moses Gibson. Wow. And my son is Weldon Martin Gibson. And he said, I wanted to name you guys all WMG because I wanted you to remember who we were. And I wanted to be able to pass down what I had to you. I have cufflinks from my dad that he had from Harvard Law School and from Rutgers. And then I have the, the, the uh, moniker initials WMG. And I passed it on to my son. This is what family, we take pride in our name, hopefully. We take pride in our customs. We take pride in our traditions, amen? You know, but God's house has a purpose that everyone plays in making it a great family. Yeah. 
a unit that thrives and shines with the love of Christ Amen. towards each other and outsiders. You know, I really believe this is that I came to church to visit you guys, and man, your love and your outpouring showed me that you guys are family. Amen. That's the power of when we are giving and doing our role as disciples. You know, you can turn with me, if you, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19 to 22. Now, follow with me. I'm using a different version. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I think it breaks it down a little better in my perspective. So I'm going to read the first version, and then I'm going to read the second version. Tell me when you guys are there. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 2, and verses 19 through 22. It says here in the scripture, NIV version, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now I'm going to read you the AMP version. You can just listen if you don't mind. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenship. But you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people, and are members of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together and it continues to increase, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, set apart, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. In him, in the fellowship with one another, you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're visiting, you know, you think about what is he talking about? You know, this temple. No, we're not talking about this room. We're talking about we decide to enter into God's kingdom. We decide to accept Jesus as Lord. We become a family. We become a family. I felt the world. I'm from Denver, Colorado. I live in Aurora, Colorado. I came here, and you guys are my family. Because I decided to have the word of God as my foundation and Christ as my cornerstone. That's amazing. And we don't understand the concept. It's a spiritual concept. That, man, you mean to tell me when I say Jesus is Lord, when I start reading the foundations of the scriptures, and we start being a body of Christ together, we become a family that matters. And the most important thing he's saying here is we become a sacred family, a set-apart family where God's presence is here. Do you believe that, church? That when you walk in here today, you walked into the family of God. Now, I know that the Flintstones and all those shows seem very exciting. But God, we are doing something that will last for eternity. Yeah. We have members that have died and gone on. Yeah. They're waiting. We have people that we'll see in heaven one day. We have people that are going to go on and do incredible things and change lives. How many of us remember when you first came to church? What was it like? How many of us remember when you first felt like, man, I belong somewhere? And it wasn't because we were all the same. It's because we were called to a family. You know, sometimes we've got to remember this is that God knows that we are imperfect, though. We're prone to make mistakes in family. We mess up. We get angry. And we even sin against each other. That's why we build our family, though, on Christ Jesus as a cornerstone. Right. Let me say something, right? Who knows right now 
of a perfect church. Anybody know where it is? Anybody can tell me the name of it? No take? Nobody? Come on. We have no church is perfect? All right, hold on. Surely tell me of the perfect family. Raise your hand. I know you guys are great people now. Raise your hand if you feel like your family is perfect. What? Nobody? David, not you. No, no, David, no. Nobody. So here's the thing you understand is, what makes God's church set apart then? Huh? God. Jesus. It's that we decide that this miraculous thing happens where we say, you know what? I'm going to let the spirit of Christ dwell inside of me. And even though I make mistakes, God's going to work out my flaws so that through our love for everybody else, our family becomes a perfect family. God, it's the love. It's the love of Jesus. That's what makes us special. You know, I have a couple points. My first point is this. A faith that's set apart. I believe that a faith that's set apart is what Jesus is looking for in us. In 1 Peter chapter 3, I mean chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 3 through 9, it says, Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Or fade I'm sorry. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power to the coming of the salvation that is revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice by God's power to the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed. And this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, result in praise, glory, and honor. And Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, I like this piece here when he talks about here is that our faith is greater worth than gold. Our faith, though, is going to be refined by fire. That's going to mean we're going to go through challenges as a family. We're going to have things that happen, media attention, you know, things that people are going to have fights together. We're going to have issues that we have to deal with. But God says it's our faith that's being refined. See, as a family, I want to call us that some, no matter where you're at spiritually, maybe you're feeling challenged right now in your spiritual faith. Maybe you feel like you don't feel like being at church. Maybe you feel like you've lost hope in God. You're going through a refinement process right now. So your faith can be proved genuine. And all of us go through things as a family at different times. You know, you ever get a, a, a cold and you feel sick? I don't know in your family who's worse, whether it's your wife, your son, or your daughters. But when I get sick, man, I get sick. And I get, I'm like knocked out. And I hate being sick. Yeah, but my wife will take care of me until I get better. I think faith is like that when we get challenged. We go through a time of sickness. We go through a time of challenge. But God, it's to refine us to be set apart to do something great for God's kingdom. You know, we have to instill faith in our home. Not through what we say, but by our actions. You know, your faith is the most powerful example that you can have. You know, my mother would say, don't show me your action but what you say by what you do. I was constantly getting in trouble as a youngster. And she would say, Wesley, I don't believe what you say. I want you to show me what you, what you do. And I really believe as a family of God, we can show that we're set apart by what we do with our faith. Amen? Amen. You know, what does it mean to be holy? It means to be called out, to be set apart. You know, God's saying here, he wants us to be holy. He wants us to live a different lifestyle. You know, God wants us to have 
authentic faith, not a fraud faith. You know, teens, do you believe that you're made to be set apart? Campus, do you believe that God's calling you to be set apart for something great in God's family? Any campus students? No campus? You guys are kind of quiet today. Do we have any singles? Any singles? Any young pros? God, young pros, you're set apart for something great. God, when I decided that I was going to follow God, I had no idea. I am a chef by trade, and I wanted to be the best chef there was. And I set up on that journey. At 13, I started cooking, and at 20 years, years old, I became what they call a sous chef. And just so you know what a sous chef is, so you have the vice president and you have the president. I was the vice president. And, and in the culinary world, the vice president sous chef does all the work. And so I become that, but back then it was a big accomplishment. And I felt like, man, this is my calling. This is what I'm called to do. I met celebrities. I cooked for Terrell Owens. I cooked for Takao Spikes. I cooked for um, Julia Child. I, I, I met little Bow Wow. That's, that's old school. But what's funny about that, I felt like I've cooked for like all kinds of people, all kinds of doctors. I had an account with Ernst and Young. I was cooking for them. Uh, I started cooking for uh, TNT. And then what I felt was like, wow, this is great, but something was missing. I didn't feel like this is my set apart calling. And then God brought me to Jesus. And I never in a million years thought about being a minister. That was the last thing I wanted to do. Wait, yeah. imagine this. Somebody met me 32 plus years ago. And here I am in Albuquerque, all from Boston, Mass, sharing my heart with my family about being called and set apart. How about you? What is God telling you? Are you living set apart life, church? I, do you believe that you're set apart? I think we got to get back believing that, man, I am called for a purpose. I am called for something greater. Even if our, our jobs, now I'm obviously going to be on staff. That's not what I'm talking about. But you and your job have something to do for your job. You and your community have someone you're going to meet. I really believe that, guys. Because like me, when I was, I was met by a friend of mine, I was lonely, I was unfulfilled, and I, I didn't want to live. And he invited me to a Bible talk, and here I am. And now in my life, no, it's not perfect, but I feel like I'm called for something great. You know, I think faith is the currency that lasts forever. That's why the enemy and spiritual forces of evil will do anything to cause us to doubt. You know, why? Because that currency, we need to please God to enter the heavenly gates. You know, how much faith do you need for God to move in your life? How much faith do we need to feel like God is calling us? Anybody can show me with a hand? I don't know, teeny little bit. You ever seen a mushroom seed before? It is tiny. God is saying you need that small bit of faith to do great things for him. That means anybody can do that, church. He wants us to be believed we're set apart. My other point is this. The family that's full of weaknesses and forgiveness. How many of us have weaknesses? Anybody? You know, this is a part that we have to understand that we have weaknesses in the church. We have weaknesses in our family. God, I know I, I seem like a nice guy, a handsome guy. But there's times I get super impatient. There's times because I'm a chef, I get like, no, this needs to be this way, no way to go. I'm constantly moving my, stuff, my wife's stuff around. She'll go in, and I'll organize it, and she'll go, Wes, yeah. Did you move something? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I did move it. Honey, can you stop doing that? 
Because in my mindset, if it's not organized, it drives me crazy. But I'm taking in liberty my white stuff. You know, sometimes we have things that we do that bother each other. Amen? Even the church, we can get each other's nerves. I thought I might get a bigger amen than that. Are you guys awake out there today? I'm almost done, I promise. Is that? But guys, let's be honest. We even get attitudes with each other. We get bitterness with our spouses. Maybe a leader has hurt, your, has hurt your feelings. And you feel like, you know what? That church is imperfect. You're right, it is. But let me clarify something. God's church is us. But the, the church really is Christ who's the head. And because he's the leader, he's the one that's perfect. We're going to be flawed. Josh and Stacy are phenomenal. The days are phenomenal. But guess what? They might hurt your feelings. But they're not going to do it on purpose. But sometimes, God, I think that we've allowed Satan to creep in the church. And somehow to believe that this church is so messed up, I'm not even coming anymore. Maybe some of us have attitudes now that we've got to get rid of. Let me tell you something, guys. I have been hurt in the church. I'm telling you, I have been hurt. I've been wronged. My kids have been hurt. I was telling Josh, my son got hurt doing a, a, a ministry role, and I wanted to pack my bags and go beat somebody up. I was heated. I was angry. I wanted to fight. I'm, I'm telling you, I had to pray. I, I mean, guys, hey, I'm just being real. My daughter was dating this guy. Well, not dating. I shouldn't say dating. He went on a date, and this guy sent her a text, and I was like, what did he send you? And I was like, I need to talk to this guy right here. And I, and I was going to intimidate him on purpose. And I'm supposed to be a minister. But guys, I'm not perfect. Guys, you're not perfect. In the Albuquerque church, I believe we got to find our way back to believe we're set apart. And I'm not trying to attack anybody. I'm not saying we're not going to struggle. But guys, we got to get back to believing that this church that we were called to is calling us to be different. Guys, Sometimes we have expectations what we want from our family to be. And we find ourselves disappointed when they aren't met. But guys, weakness is a part of being self-aware in order to see our need for Jesus in his power. I'll say that again. Weakness is a part of being self-aware in order to see our need for Jesus in his power. You know, guys... Just to share this with you is that, you know, I'm a Christian for 32 years, and I remember back when I was a young Christian, I didn't struggle with, you know, feeling like I was depressed. Or, you know, you, know, you feel like you have mental health issues. We didn't talk about that back then. It doesn't mean it didn't exist. And it's real. We go through struggles. It's hard to get up sometimes. It's hard to feel motivated sometimes. It's hard to be married. It's hard to be single. It's hard to be a teen. It's hard to be in campus. It's hard to be older and get old. It's hard when you lose a spouse, when you lose your parents. And guys, it has been hard these past two years. My wife lost her dad. I lost my dad. And man, I'm telling you, I didn't feel motivated to be set apart. That's a part of the process, guys. And that's why we as a family have to accept each other with all of our weaknesses and all. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, Colossians 3, you guys there? It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and of all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, one family, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell in you weekly. Right? Minimally. Right? Not at all. Not richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all kinds of psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, 
Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And I want to call us back, church, to compassion as we do life together. Call us back to kindness displayed in our hearts and our attitudes. Humility as we learn how to have better relationships. Guys, you know, if you've messed up with somebody in a relationship, raise your hand. Even this morning I messed up with my wife. I said something dumb. I was like, man, it's Mother's Day, Wes. But I had to go back and apologize. And sometimes here's the thing, guys, you got to understand. Don't just say, yeah, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. No, no, no. you got to go back and apologize until it's felt. And you got to ask that person, hey, I want to apologize. Do you forgive me? And I want to know, is there anything else that I did that I need to know? I think sometimes we apologize. We don't ask the person we offended, do you feel like my apology was sincere? Do you feel like my apology met your needs as far as knowing that you forgive me? Yes. Guys, the pain may still be there. You ever have a Charlie horse before? And it comes to your leg and you're scraping and you're scraping like that. That's how pain is in relationships. And it grabs you. Oh, goodness. And then you need somebody to stretch it out. And then sometimes you feel it's gone, but you wonder, oh, no, it's going to come again. That's how it is in relationships, guys. It may still be there, but you got to stretch it out. And I want to encourage it as a church. I know that this church is an amazing church, but I believe there's a calling that we've got to fulfill. You know, this is a big one. Forgiving grievances that have been committed against us or committed against others. You know, I know that I had to forgive situations even from afar, even my own siblings. We got to do that as a church to be set apart. You know, something we got to talk about in closing is this. We heard that word admonishing. You know what admonishing means? It means to warn someone of something to be avoided. That's all it means. Sometimes we think, I'm going to admonish you, brother. I'm going to rebuke you. No. I, listen, I need to be admonished. I am, I am a jokester. Even at my older age, I joke. I came here and I was out there with Karen and I said, Karen, uh, is that bell real? She's like, yeah. Can I ring it? Well, I'm not sure. And I was afraid because my luck, I ring it and the cops come. <laughs> so before I left, I went, bing, 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 I rang it. You know, because I feel like I love to have fun, right? Sometimes we challenge people on the wrong things. We get so nitpicky. We're the sin police. God, we don't have to be sin police. I think we got to let people be themselves. You know, hey, if someone likes to have fun, have fun, as long as it's not hurting anybody. But I think we've lost the art of admonishment. We're willing to challenge each other and urge and advise one another. This part of what family does and should do. Guys, we've got to get back to the balance of calling each other higher. And don't be afraid of it. Guys, I need to be called higher. I have given my wife, my kids, carbon to say, if I'm messing up, speak to me. I don't always like it. I can be defensive. What? I do that. They go, okay, I'm being prideful. And I want to give us this church is this, is that God wants us to be a family with the purpose of being set apart. We're called to embark on being ambassadors for Christ that show the world what true family is when we live our lives like Christ. We've got to be full of love, hope, perseverance, and compassion. Let's be that family church. Today we have an example at Mother's Day. Go out, love somebody. You know people that don't have mothers, encourage them. You know, even if you and your mom, maybe it's it's hard, give her a call, send her a text. Guys, the thing we don't realize is tomorrow is not promised. And I think we got to take advantage. Next week is not promised. And I want to encourage you, Albuquerque Church, you guys are an amazing church. And I believe there's something special here. So guys, let's go out and live set-apart lives as God's church. To God be the glory. Amen.